Welcome back to Channel 9 Live. Uh, my name is John Papa. I'm a cloud developer advocate here in Azure. And we're having a great time at Build. I've got some folks up here who know a little bit about a topic called Node. Node. Well, Node. Why don't we introduce each other real quick? You are? Hi, I'm Dan Shaw, uh, founder and chief evangelist of Node Source. Node Source. Node Source. Right there. There you go. <laughs> all right. I'm Gaurav Seth. I'm a lead PM on uh, all things JavaScript here. So look at the Chakra engine, look at TypeScript, and uh, Node.js on Azure. Hold on. You work for Microsoft? Yep. And you work with JavaScript and Node? Yep. That's that is it. awesome. That is How are you hiring? Job. I am. <laughs> that is awesome. I am. I am totally <laughs> hiring. So if you're interested, hit me up. All right. You heard it right here. I'm Jonathan Carter. I'm a PM at Microsoft as well, working on Gaurav's team on Node.js and Azure. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Joe Doyle, Solutions Architect Manager. I work with Dan at NodeSource. That's fantastic. So here at Bill, we've been talking a lot about Azure. Azure's been all the buzz, right? Yep. Running everything in the cloud. And the cloud runs everything, pretty mm -hmm. much. So one of those things that runs is Node. And you guys have some stuff that runs with Node as well. Can you tell us about what NodeSource does? Right, so at NodeSource, you know, we, we were created to really enable the enterprise. We came at uh, the, the, the challenge of Node from the underserved enterprise. And it sounds odd to, you know, in, in such a uh, enterprise-friendly environment here at Build uh, to, you know, assert that you know, Node was not enterprise-friendly. But, you know, several years ago, Node was being used by, you know, hackers and startups. Right. And, uh, you know, businesses were seeing the value of using uh, Node.js, writing end-to-end -end, uh, JavaScript applications and really accelerating development with that. Uh, and they needed uh, you know, a, a partner in that experience. So, so let, me, let me stop you there. So you're saying lots of companies, like they use Java.net, things like that. Yep. I said the other word, right? Java. <laughs> and they use these things, but they get a lot of support. They always know they can go call companies right. to help them solve problems. Node kind of spawned out of another world, right? Right, yeah. And it slowly eked its way into the enterprise and a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. Now they're leaning on this because they can build things fast, easily, and pull an open source. But how do they... How do they manage those other parts, like operational stuff, analytics, right. um, data tracking? So, uh, you know, th th these companies were used to, you know, 10, 15 year maturity of operational tools. And you look at Node, and Node is like, it's, you know, intentionally tiny. It's, it's you know, right. this hyper minimalist platform. And when you're taking that, deploying that with your operations team, you know, what are they looking at? What, how, are they, how do they know, uh, you know, node application, tell me, are you okay? Uh, you know, that is, you know, uh, non-trivial. So, uh, you know, to be able to, to bring that and bring that whole team experience into the Node.js deployment to, to support uh, modern DevOps best practices uh, is, is why NodeSource, you know, entered into the ecosystem and, and really uh, has been driving that, uh, you know, this business needs, listening to the pain points and uh, you know, providing the solutions to, to make that easy uh, and, uh, you know, having, having the uh, always on best practices by default. So let, let's, make a, let's make this practical and have some real world examples mm -hmm. here. Let's say we've got an app running with Node. It actually be running with anything, but let's right. it's Node. Yep. We write apps and let's be honest, not every set of code is perfect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's hidden bugs, things that happen later that you, as much unit testing and other kinds of testing you can do, you're not going to catch it all. Right. The best CI process. Mm -hmm. You go live, something goes down. We want something as an enterprise, a CXO level to say, okay, it went down, I want to identify it immediately. Right. I want to alert the right people mm -hmm. immediately and then hopefully have an automated way to fix it. Right. But the first step is always detecting the problem. Yep. How do you do that with Node? And how do you guys help with that? Well, uh, some of the approaches that we uh, enable out of the box is um, you, know, you, can, you can run a CPU profile and, and automatically get a, a flame graph uh, with uh, Node Source and Solid. So you know, you're running your application. There's uh, you know, your code. It's you know, not working as you expect. Uh, where is the issue? Right. Uh, you know, I just know the, the, it isn't working. Right. You know. <laughs> oh, you know. Where, where, where do I go? Uh, you would have to, in you know, kind of the, the normal case, take it out of production, uh, go and, and instrument the code, put it into a staging environment, and in the meantime, hope, I'm losing millions hope of dollars. and pray <laughs> that you're going to figure out where the issue is. Right. Uh, with with N Solid, that's you know, out of the box, enabled. N Solid's uh, your product. 
Yes. Okay. Just make Lightweight, sure. and uh, you're able to identify the issue. But you know, maybe you're a, an operations team member. Uh, you didn't write that code. You don't know where that uh, issue. You, know, you could see that there's an issue there, but you don't know uh, what to do with that. You hand that off to your dev team. They can go uh, and you know, go back to the, that uh, that page and and see the the same flame graph and have the the deep insight of uh, where it is in the code get that fixed, put it into production, and uh, you're... Cool. you're uh, so like exceptions, memory leaks, things like this, it can help identify right. and locate quickly. Yep. That's pretty awesome. Right. So how do you, this, help me connect some dots here. We've got some folks from Microsoft, some folks from NodeSource. What are you doing here at Build This Week? Right, so <laughs> you know, we're here for a reason, right? <laughs> we, yeah, we are here. Uh, well, we're here to sell, uh, you know, Node Source, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, the reason why we're we're here at Build is uh, to support our relationship with with Microsoft, who's been doing a, a fantastic job at uh, you know not only supporting Node, but you know, uh, you know, Azure is a great platform for for running Node. Yes. And uh, so uh, here at Microsoft Build, we announced the availability. Uh, in the Azure marketplace of uh, Node Source and Solid. It, so, uh, with a one click uh, deployment, you can have your uh, you know, N Solid cluster up and running and uh, you're, you're off to the races. And can you point that at multiple? Like app services and yep. functions. How about Azure Functions support that as well? We don't support Azure Functions yet. Um, you know, hopefully but app we'll, services are we'll, there. Yes. 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 Okay. yes. <laughs> gotcha, cool. Uh, I'm a. Full disclosure, I am a the node guy for running apps in Azure from the advocate side, so it's totally interesting to me to be able to not only diagnose things with like app insights, mm -hmm. but also to be able to dive deep into what's actually happening beyond the code I wrote. Right. So we can take this to the marketplace, attach it to our apps, get this information from multiple environments and slots. Right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And where do you uh, learn more about this, by the way, so we make sure we don't miss? So absolutely, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a portal at azure.com slash node. You can find all the information. You can go directly to uh, the end solid on the Azure Marketplace from there. And uh, you'll find also the, the resources that you know, our, our team's been you know, working on. How, how do you operationalize this? How do we make it easy uh, and understandable to, okay. to, to take that into to practice and uh, you know, have uh, easy to follow steps to, to go and put this into production? If we could kind of step up for a minute too, I think it'd be good to help understand and set the table. This is really interesting of what we're talking about, but people are using Node in a lot of weird places these days. Places we wouldn't have expected years ago, right? <laughs> and I know from personal experience, trying to get Node to work in the enterprise, there was resistance originally right. when I'm going down this road. But I find it really interesting to see how are you all working together? Like, did you guys approach them or vice versa? What's the relationship? Right. No, that's that's a great question. And you know, kind of stepping up and taking a broader look. You know, I look at uh, Node as a three-pronged pillar or three-pronged story for us. You know, the first and the foremost thing is being there in the ecosystem, being there in the community, being there in the foundation. So as Microsoft, one of the things we are doing is we are pretty heavily engaged on all of those fronts. You know, one of the things, we are part of the Node Foundation. I'm in fact a director there representing Microsoft. Uh, you know, we are working in the code base now. We have more people, more developers kind of going, looking at the Node. So we're making PRs. Yeah, into the Node. Right in the core, code base. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, we've been to two couple of places or couple of places where we've been most inter most interacting with the people are around diagnostics, and the other place is the Nappy project, which is essentially trying to bring abstraction uh, to Node. So being in the ecosystem is the first pillar. The second big pillar for us is when we think about uh, you know Microsoft and all of the capabilities and uh, you know products we have the first thing comes is developers right so we have some great products in visual studio code vs vs for mac uh, and one of the things we're working through is like to think through the end to end holistic journey mm -hmm. for a developer as he comes so we you know we have a great solution in vs code you have TypeScript as a great language for enterprise developers you know who are digging into javascript want to sure. create stuff with scale to the other end, you know that we go to, like with uh, CI, CD. We of course, uh, you know, in between there's Azure, but that's my third pillar that I come to. So you have this end-to-end -end tooling that we want to bring up. The third pillar is really Azure. Like we have a great cloud. Uh, you know, people always have this incorrect notion that hey, if I'm thinking about OSS technologies, if I'm thinking about something like uh, Node, should I think about Azure? 
Absolutely yes, because Node, ha I mean Azure has great support for Node.js and some of the associated technologies. Uh, and you know Jonathan has in fact been working on a lot of those, and he can kind of give you a, a nutshell. So when we look at these three pillars, you know one of the thing is working with people in companies and partner teams which are closely entrenched in this space. You know, for us, NodeSource was, uh, of course, one of the uh, you know, obvious players who is in this place. You know, so, is, uh, so are some of the others. Like, there's Nearform, there's Rising Stack, uh, you know, whom it's we like are like New Relic with. as well, which does some similar yeah, stuff. Yeah, so they, they do yeah. a little bit of the, uh, you know, APM stuff, uh, just like we have uh, App Insights. But, you know, it was, it was a great relationship building, uh, you know, as we started working on this. NodeSource was, in fact, like, you know, we've been collaborating for a very long time, you know, back from the days where we, you know, brought in some of the other technologies to Node and we started working on how we get Microsoft more involved in Node. Mm -hmm. So our relationship actually goes all the way back when they you know, started forming Node. Uh, so, you know, source. some people are going to have a real problem with this. You know why? A lot of people got into Node and JavaScript because it was like the cool alternative thing to do, right? right, right. If you're going to make it mainstream and make it easy to work with the enterprise, that's going to have a real impact on people doing the cool thing, right? I, I, I've, I've, I've gotten, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've gotten <laughs> that feedback uh, over the years. Yes. And the reality is um, it is enabling uh, developer happiness and developer joy. Uh, you know, so the, the, the experience at, that we had at PayPal, so I, I helped uh, bring in Node.js and, and really uh, take the, the, you know, the Java stack that they had there and bring uh, that all over to, to Node.js. Um, one of the, the greatest takeaways from uh, that, that experience is the level of developer satisfaction that they uh, uh, were able to uh, get in their internal surveys. Uh, the teams that were working on their, their Java stack versus the teams that were working on the Node.js stack. The developer uh, satisfaction was way higher in the Node.js. Why? Why do you think that is? I think it comes from shipping code. Right. The shipping code is where developers get their... So you their think they, they think shipping code is faster and more efficient? Shipping efficiently? code wins. You, when you are a developer, when you see your code live in production, you get that endorphin rush. That's mine. I accomplished something. So the, the more that we can enable uh, you know, the shipping of code, the agility, that, the, that time to market, you know, what the, my experience with uh, Java Stack is you know, you're looking typically at six to 24 months uh, end to end in the, the development of, of a project. With Node, we're seeing that you know, more along the lines of two to eight months. And you know, with now with you know, things like Azure Functions and Functions as a Service, uh, you know, we're seeing that accelerating even further. So microservices are becoming function services and uh, you know, we're getting to a really exciting moment in development where we, we can are. get you know, live in production in the arc of a day uh, and have the you know, developer satisfaction that we've accomplished something, that we're delivering user value uh, well, I think you know. you're hitting the nail on the head because a lot of people, I call this the biggest lie we tell ourselves in technology, is, mm -hmm. is developers feel like sometimes we say, and I've said this myself, I'll use that technology because it's faster, better than technology mm -hmm. X or Y. Right. And I don't think that's true. I think we're lying to ourselves when we say that because Node, Java, ASP.NET, whatever, mm -hmm. we pick the technology we pick because we enjoy using it. Yeah. Yeah. If people who write with Node like writing with Node, mm -hmm. and people write with Java like writing with Java, right. it may be the thing they've used for years, and they just want to stick with it, but that's why people stick or go or gravitate towards a technology, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Most of us, at least, go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And with that, if you can make not only the development experience faster, right? Everyone can write Hello World in anything. Sure. Right? <laughs> sure. That yep. works great. Yep. You don't need right. Node Source to write Hello World. <laughs> <laughs> at least I hope you don't, right? <laughs> but once you do that and you want to go to production, you've got to debug your apps. You've got to be able yep. to diagnose them. And that all goes in with making your CXO level happy mm -hmm. yep. and making sure you can uh, feel confident that, hey, if something breaks and someone's going, oh my gosh, something broke, you've got to go fix it. You've right. got to feel confident that you know how to solve that problem. Right. And I think that's where J .NET and Java have been for years, mm -hmm. that maturity level yep. you talked about. Yep. And I think Node's coming there. Yeah. So Jonathan, you work a lot with these kind of different technologies. What's been your experience working with Node as far as getting it out to uh, different kind of scenarios? You know, I would echo really what Dan s said, that you know, the excitement that we've seen working with many Node developers similarly to front-end web developers or kind of the JavaScript ecosystem as a whole is just the excitement around the agility, the productivity that you gain, the vast prolific ecosystem that exists, which 
helps with the morale and happiness boost and the feeling of how much you can achieve and collaborate with people. Um, and so really, you know, from our perspective with Azure, between that, VS Code, you know, trying to help make sure we can contribute to, as you take that productive environment into production, um, how can you continue to achieve those gains of productivity as well as having the operational capabilities you have, whether it's diagnostics, if something goes wrong in production, or being able to ship at a cadence that's as fast as your team is capable of sustaining, um, and across all various types of compute models that, that work for you. Mm -hmm. So whether you want to just do a Git deployment of a Node.js app to a simple cloud service, we want to make sure that that's simple and easy. If you want to go use Docker containers, which of course we're seeing everybody is moving to for yep. great reason, portability, lots of great value there. Um, we want to make sure we embrace that too, because there's elements of developer happiness that comes along with, with that product, um, or functions, or once you've adopted containers and you now want to scale into a microservice architecture, what can we provide there to make sure that you're using Kubernetes or DCOS or Docker Swarm and you can continue to feel empowered and, and happy with that setup. Mm -hmm. And so really, you know, what we've been seeing is the response that people have to you know, our contributions to make sure that, that we meet no developers where they're at, bringing Azure to the forefront yeah. of their workflow, embracing OSS everywhere we possibly can while adding the, the value and the operational infrastructure that Azure specializes in. Um, and, and really, you know, Azure plus OSS has been a, a great marriage uh, and experience for, for developers. And so I, I've been very excited to see it, you know, plus VS Code getting layered in there to provide a great local developer environment, be productive pre-deployment, post-deployment. Um, yeah, it's been really exciting. I think that's, you hit the nail on the head, I think, with where people are going with it. I think the excitement people have with Node is Azure seems to be meeting the Node developers where they are, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And through these tools that you guys are putting in as well, yeah. it's not like, hey, you're doing everything great, we yeah. love you, now change everything about you, yep. right. and you can use this yep, right. tool, right? So going to where they are, acting the way they are, and using the tools and the ecosystem they are. Uh, one thing I think I find a lot with Node, and I'd like to get your guys' opinion on how it works, is when people start using Node, I think there's this misconception that when I, especially more with JavaScript than Node, mm -hmm. I think, that mm -hmm. JavaScript is the Wild West and it's so hard to code in and blah, blah, blah. And you can, it's not like C Sharp or Java where there's never a problem, right? right. You can't write right. a bad line of code in C Sharp <laughs> or Java. Right. Uh, right. It's JavaScript, it can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah. The way I like to explain it, too, is um, okay, so imagine going over the Golden State Bridge, right? Golden Gate Bridge. And you're going over there and there's guardrails up on the side. If you decide you want to start bouncing off the guardrails, It'll keep you on the road. You'll be a bad driver. <laughs> right. That's C Sharp or Java. They've got things in place to stop you, but you're still going to get to the other side. JavaScript is the same bridge without the guardrails. Right. Mm -hmm. You're still going to get to the other side, but if you choose, you can go off and swim in the bay. Yep. Right? right. Yep. Totally. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but the same thing is both, you can have bad drivers in both languages. Mm -hmm. So you, we all write bad code eventually. We look at the code wrote yesterday and things are bad. Right. But in this Node ecosystem, when you've got a language like JavaScript, which I happen to love the freedom mm -hmm. that it gives you, and I think we all do because we right. write this stuff, mm -hmm. how do you, as a corporate environment, make sure that you've got the things in place to make sure that when there is that bad driver, you can find it? Right. What are you all finding? Joe. Sure. Well, you know, we have a lot of great development experience across many languages, and best practices are often best practices for a reason, and they often translate across those languages. So, uh, you know, like any good programming environment, unit tests still get you part of the way. Um, to even help a little bit further, uh, Microsoft has TypeScript, which we're seeing a lot of adoption inside the enterprise, which kind of tries to bring those guardrails back a little bit for JavaScript. Uh, you know, Visual Code has great tooling around TypeScript. Uh, a lot of it's built in and, and kind of on by default. You may not even know it. Uh, but really, you know, following a lot of the best guidelines, you know, still got to test. You know, that doesn't go yeah. away no matter what you do. And DevOps um, built yeah, in with DevOps. that, right? Right, exactly. And in addition, you know, especially as we start to move towards the cloud, uh, it's no longer you're running one instance of your application. So you have to already be prepared for if that one instance goes down, it should be one of 10, one of 20. And, you know, use those same DevOps best practices for how did you manage your apps in the past? You, you have a restart policy. You have guidelines to say, hey, be aware of when things have stopped. Make sure that we're restarting them. 
You know, uh, one of the great things with containers nowadays is we have all these great orchestration systems. We can use Kubernetes to say, hey, make sure that there are 12 instances of my app running all the time. If one dies, Kubernetes has the, the functionality to go and restart that. Make sure that we're, we're meeting that service level that Divert we're Divert to the others, restart the one, yep. then pull it back in the pool. Exactly. That's, that's great. And let's say we're building an app. We talked about things you guys can detect, too. Common problem I see in Node code is somebody will do a JSON parse. Yep. And you can't say that's a yep. bad practice because <laughs> maybe the thing it's parsing is really tiny, mm -hmm. right? It's like eight lines of code, who cares? But maybe that thing is also 15 meg right. file. Right. <laughs> so uh, for example, if that happens, it's blocking the event loop. Right. Yep. Nothing else can happen. Uh, then all of a sudden, your vice president comes down and goes, hey, you're fired, node sucks. Yep. <laughs> um, how do we, we can't detect all that kind of stuff with linters. We can see it's a parse, but we don't know what it's parsing. Right. How do we define these things like in a live production site? You mentioned Kubernetes. That could be something that causes that app not to crash, maybe, but to be like non-responsive. Mm -hmm. Right. So what can we do to kind of combat some of that stuff? Well, you know, the great thing with our you know, modern systems and, and, and running with in, inside of containers in Kubernetes is our systems are ephemeral now. There, we're scaling up, we're scaling down uh, dynamically. You know, everybody's looking up that word right now. <laughs> 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 Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, the, these instances uh, of, of our app, you know, uh, the, the, one of the beautiful things about Node is it takes moments to be live. Yeah. So if you're used to, you know, the old school monolithic deployment where, hey, we got to, you know, warm this thing up for five minutes before, you know, we can put it into the, the load balancer, that's not Node. Node is you know, in uh, milliseconds live and you're, you're, you're off to the races. So uh, you can dynamically scale up and scale down uh, based on the, your, your needs of the, the system. So uh, you know, if you have uh, 15 megs that come up every once in a while, uh, then you know that's easy in a Kubernetes deployment to you know scale around and 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 uh, deal with that. You can set your strategy with Azure to say, hey, right. you know, scale up when these things happen, yep. and then when it relieves itself, automatically right. compress back down. Um, with NSolid, you can set threshold criteria. So if your uh, application goes out uh, into a very high CPU usage or very high memory usage, you can automatically trigger a, uh, a, you know, a flame graph and, you know, and get a snapshot of, of the state of your application at a time and dive in. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, you can do to, to mitigate that JSON parse, if you're frequently uh, getting a, uh, a large uh, object that, that you need to, to handle, is uh, using the, the Node.js capability of streams. So you turn that into a streaming parser. So you mentioned right. that we're blocking the event loop. So you know, we have one function that is occupying all the time uh, of our event loop. And so you have to, to wait until that function's done, and then we go on to the next uh, element in the event loop. Uh, when you break that in down into to streams, you break that down into very granular chunks that you can say, all right, I've gotten some of the data. We're going to deal with it. We're but going to parse it. The loop. Don't bar yeah. block the loop, and you're able to uh, to deal with that in a in a, in a different architectural way. Uh, so you mentioned something I really want to ask one good question about because the the flame graph. Yeah. One of the problems we have in production a lot is we don't know what the problem is till we know what the problem is. Right. So when something goes down, usually what happens in, in my experience is they don't say, hey, Jonathan, go fix it, tell me what's wrong. I'll make sure all the customers understand you're looking at it while they can't function. <laughs> what they're really doing is saying, restart the server, <laughs> right? And yep. then they go tell you, hey, it's broken. Mm -hmm. Will you tell me why? And at that point, you've lost all lost data. Lost all your contacts. Right. So yeah. can we configure with Ensolid to figure out how we get the flame graph any time there's a crash or things like that? How do we, how do we use that to help diagnose those issues? We we can uh, we can go in and have the the threshold settings. You know, uh, you're out of uh, uh, you know, memory and CPU situation. Right, uh, so it's usually the, one of those two things. Right, yeah. the uh, the area where you know your your systems you know completely died. Uh, you know we we won't capture that. Right, because you know, it's died. It's, it's gone. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. But usually, it's, it's, I don't ephemerized. See it's gone. <laughs> usually with Node, it's more like it's hanging because it's doing right. something with memory or CPU or right. something yep. else. And, and those yeah. are the moments that you know, are, are, we, we can capture. And, and That's like uh, having your own personal Jonathan sitting there. That's right. Know, waiting for Clicking 
the guy yeah. 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 and calling yeah. you. And <laughs> I'm happy to that's do really it. what's happening. Jonathan's <laughs> sitting inside of Ensign. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Got it. This is awesome. That's why our relationship yeah. is so good. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we so, feed him. Yeah. As <laughs> I think the main theme I'm seeing here is that Node is not just a, it's not a second class citizen with Azure. No. no. Right? I mean, it's really become a major player in the Azure world. Right. Yep. Yeah. Running on Linux, running on uh, Azure. This is what all the cloud providers are doing these days, running yep. lots of Node. Yep. yep. This totally. is awesome. Yeah. Yep. Hey, guys, thanks for coming on. I'm going to go check it out myself. Right. Yeah. So it's azure.com slash. Azure.com slash Node. And if you want to learn more about NodeSource, nodeSource.com. Thanks, man. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.